thank you for joining us. I am Alex Shahidi, uh, co-CIO of uh, Evoke Advisors and Eris Consulting, a large RIA in Los Angeles. And I have the honor of being joined by Jeffrey Gunlack uh, virtually. Uh, Jeffrey is the founder, CEO, and CIO of Double Line Capital, uh, a, an investment manager based in Los Angeles as well. Uh, and his firm is entrusted with 141 billion in assets. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Jeffrey. Thanks, Alex. Nice to be here. Uh, you are famous for making bold predictions, as, as we just discussed. Uh, four years ago, uh, you uh, were virtually certain that, that Trump would win, and, and we saw what happened, despite what the polls suggested. Uh, this year, uh, my, my sense is you were not as convicted in the ultimate outcome, but you were sure that it was going to be a tight race. Here yes. we are two days after the election. Uh, which still not, we don't have an official result. Please share with us your current thinking. And then importantly, what this means for markets after this initial optimism wears off potentially. It's surprising how deeply and evenly split the country seems to be. I mean, the Senate, they're not really sure who's going to uh, retain control. It looks like the Republicans, but it's almost, some, some websites say it's 48-48 and some say it's 48-46. And there's a few left. It looks like the, the Democrats won't get to 50. So, but it's incredibly split. Um, it, that I think was predictable. Um, I thought going into the election that the polls again were wrong and I thought they were even more wrong. And it turns out that they were. I mean, there were polls that said Biden by 17 in Wisconsin. I mean, that's just laughable. The, that polling firm should be shut down. I mean, it was, it was inside of 1%. They're off by 17 percentage points and national polls predicting a win of high single digits or even 10%. And of course, it's unpopular. It's, it's, I think it's inside of three. So uh, we don't know who's going to win. Um, Trump, on the vote count, looks like uh, odds are not so, not so strong. But I don't know. There's weird things. I heard that the uh, turnout in Wisconsin was something very close to 90% which that seems pretty weird to me. I, you can't get 90% of anything. I mean, you can't get 90% of people to agree that Elvis died back in the 80s and they think he's alive and living on Mars, at least 10% of people. So I think the um, down ballot, the Senate and the House, that was my strongest conviction prediction, strongest conviction predictions, good rhyme, uh, for this election. And that was, I thought that a lot of people vote for, voted for Biden because they would have voted for a trash can full of dumpster juice rather than vote for Donald Trump. They just hated him so much. And yet at the same time, behind Joe Biden is a, a candidate who is not shy in her progressive, uh, nearly socialist views and garnered virtually no support whatsoever in the primary. She had to drop out with a 2% polling amongst her own party. And so I thought a lot of people would go in there and they hate Trump, so they might uh, just vote for whatever box doesn't say Trump on it. And at the same time, they might want to hedge their bet by saying, I'm not sure that Joe Biden's going to make it for four years. Two thirds of Americans in both parties are skeptical that Joe will make it four years if he wins. And so a vote for Joe is sort of a partial vote for a socialist agenda in some future uh, period in the next four years. And I thought people would say, I'm going to try to keep this thing a, a little bit less scary. And that appears to be what's happened. Now, markets, I think, like uh, a split government. I think uh, that's been the case for uh, most of my career. And so it's not surprising to me that this outcome, which seems to be very split, is uh, strong for the stock market. Now, the other thing that's happened, there's two things that happen that are contradictory in markets, which will have to be sorted out in the weeks ahead. The first is bond yields fell uh, pretty sharply. That I think is logical and it implies that with a split government, there's gonna be less stimulus. And with less stimulus, that means a, a much weaker case for an elevated inflation rate. So I think bond yields falling is, is sensible and that inflation is not likely to move up very much in 2021. We have a model at Double Line that's worked remarkably well. It's quite simplistic. That's why the fact that it works so well is remarkable. It suggests that inflation will peak in May of 2021, uh, headline CPI at 2.3. I think if anything, that that forecast will probably start skewing lower. 
and, and there, therefore, you know, it's not likely that the Fed is going to see any inflation scare whatsoever. And yet with the fiscal stimulus being less likely to be of um, enormity uh, in terms of size, that the Fed is probably likely to be even easier and more willing to do these large scale asset purchases that they've talked about and all that. Contradictory to bond yields falling against the inflation case is a huge rise in gold and Bitcoin. Uh, gold went up $46 today and is now at nearly, a, a, it's a three, three and a half month high. And Bitcoin has made me an honest man uh, for 2020. I said in my Just Markets webcast, which is up there the first week of January, basically, I said, I'm super, I don't like, I'm not a big, I'm not a, a Bitcoin cult person at all. I've never bought it in my life. I've never shorted it. I'm just watching it from afar, but I do know I do understand how speculation works and how market psychology works. And I said I think Bitcoin will make it to fifteen thousand this year, and that was a pretty bold prediction because it was down well below ten thousand at the time. And today it actually went above fifteen thousand. And gold and Bitcoin have been very highly correlated, so people use them as flights, flight to quality assets, safety assets, and inflation assets. So it is a little weird that both Bitcoin and gold have surged in recent days, just recently, really last two days, at the same time as bond yields have fallen. But we've seen stocks get really elevated over that period. I, I think that the US stock market is really overvalued. Uh, we see global growth predictions outside of the United States by mainstream economists, if you just take their consensus. The United States growth in 2021 is forecast to be 3.7% real GDP. And the total world GDP forecast, including the US, is 5.2, which suggests that the United States is way weaker than the rest of the world. Because if you took the US out, the rest of the world would have an even higher forecast than 5.2. And the United States stock market has wildly outperformed the rest of the world stock market for the last decade. In fact, it accelerated during uh, the first part of COVID that outperformance, although it stalled out in the last few several weeks. Um, and so you look at the valuation of the US stock market and the valuation of US stock market versus GDP is the highest of all time. The PE ratio is now 30, uh, which is higher than 1929. It's not as high as the dot-com situation because there's actually more earnings now, but it's, it's, uh, it's really elevated. The CAPE ratio is similarly up at 30. That's Dr. Schiller's sickly adjusted PE ratio. That's really high. The market capitalization as a percentage of GDP is an all time high level and all of this stuff. Whereas other markets are not performing well. There's a, there's a myth that the US stock market, is, that the world stock market is on some sort of bull market tear. Nothing could be further from the truth. It hasn't really gone up in nearly three years. If you take the United States out, it absolutely hasn't gone up in the last three years. And, and also, if we want to focus in uh, into really some of the underlying health of the market, so the, the S&P 500 is one of the narrowest advances it's ever had. If you break down the S&P 500 into two sectors, the S&P 494, which are the 494 smaller companies, and the, S, and the S&P 6, which are uh, the FANGs plus Microsoft, the picture is wildly different. The S&P 494 is not at a new high. It's, it's sort of where it was two years ago. And of course, the Super 6 have been uh, carrying the whole market on their back. So uh, I think narrow markets aren't very uh, attractive. And lastly, there's a retail frenzy that occurred in the aftermath of the money spray of the $3 trillion of transfer payments uh, in response to COVID. Uh, that money spray pretty clearly went into the stock market from the retail investor. You can see it in E-Trade account signups, in retail uh, platform trading volumes, in records being shattered, not just broken, shattered in the number of speculative trades in the options market. And they're all on the call side from retail investors. So I, I think that what's likely to happen as we move forward is, uh, and this has been altered a little bit by this election outcome. I expected uh, stimulus uh, in January and I thought that if Biden won, it would be pretty big, but I'm having a feeling that that might not uh, be nearly as big. And there's gonna be, I think, increased rancor between uh, the state governments and the federal government based upon, of course, partisan splits, because it's hard for me to see 
the Senate being uh, potentially controlled by Republicans, wanting to give money to the states that are government, they're Democrat controlled. And those are the ones that have the most egregious budget imbalances. And that would be for sure would have been a focus of uh, if there was a unified uh, blue uh, federal government, that would have clearly been a thank you from the, the Democratic establishment to the Democratic governors. And that would have been, I think, pretty massive. That's gonna be pared back. So the market is for now uh, choosing to view this um, split government as it appears to be as a positive. And I think that was why the market started rising even on election day and the day before after falling last week. It seems like a million years ago, but it fell quite a lot last week. And uh, I, I thought at the time it was predicting uh, a chance of a, a blue uh, sweep, but then that went away uh, on Monday and Tuesday. And I think uh, the polls were tightening too. So very strange election in 2016, I was certain Trump was gonna win. I was actually certain before the primaries even started. Um, and I said, if you think 2016 is weird, wait till 2020. And I think I'll call that a correct prediction as well. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna double down on that. If you think 2020 is weird, and it sure is, from, from even just the riots in the streets and all, everything else, the defund the police stuff, and now this unknown election outcome, I think 2020 is gonna be a, a real, real horror show uh, because the problems that are causing this rancor in the society continue to escalate. And that's things like income inequality and, and uh, you know, just mistrust. And, uh, you know, some of the consequences of the stimulus are tremendously uneven. Uh, this is the first recession in which personal disposable income actually went up. That's thanks to the, the transfer payments of $3 trillion. You take those away and of course it collapsed. So actually spending by lower wage that used to be employed people actually went up because they're making more money unemployed than they were employed thanks to the, the packages that were put forth in March and April. And so there's actually a pretty robust increase in consumer spending at the low income level. It's the opposite at the high income level where the money is being saved. And also job losses are very uneven. At the higher wage jobs, there is no growth in unemployment now. It's made it all the way back to pre-COVID. At lower wage levels, it's still an 18% drop in employment. And, that, and finally, there's a big unevenness between large business and small business. Small businesses have not really recovered much at all. In fact, I think it's still getting worse for small business. 24% of the small businesses that were open at year end 2019 are now closed. Uh, and that's a net number. Uh, so that's, a, that's kind of the, the situation we find ourselves in. I think that uh, ultimately with the US having the highest response just about to the recession, the consequence of that ultimately will be a very large decline in the value of the dollar. That hasn't really begun in earnest at all. Uh, it's down 10% or so, 8% or so from its high in the middle of the year, but it's not down very much. I think it's going to drop quite significantly in the years ahead because the deficit is highly correlated. The growth of the deficit is highly correlated to weakness in the dollar. And basically with a two year lag and the dollar peaked out uh, quite some time ago. And we'll watch to see weakness there as we move into late 2021 and 2022. So I'll stop there and uh, maybe I've drifted a distance from the election, but I'm happy to go back if you'd like to. No, that, that's a really helpful perspective. Uh, let, let's let's uh, shift gears and talk a little bit about risk. Uh, your, your firm, Double Line, uh, your philosophy is avoid catastrophic collisions by not crossing that, that double line onto right. oncoming traffic. Right. Um, so let, let's let's with that in mind, let's talk about central bank policy. Uh, mm -hmm. So you had this you had this you know economic collapse due to COVID, um, and the response was cut rates to zero very quickly, uh, start printing money, and promise to do it as much as necessary. Uh, run un un unprecedented deficits. We had a trillion dollar deficit before COVID. Now it's multi trillions with no end in sight. Now maybe that slows with a with a split government, but the the plan is print and spend, print and spend. So has the government crossed that double line? Are we in dangerous territory here? How do you see this playing out? I think the reason that we're in dangerous territory with the Fed is they have gone rogue. Uh, the Fed is not allowed to buy corporate bonds. They're not allowed to, to lend money to corporations. 
and yet they've done that. Now they've done it, you know, one one step removed, you know, a little bit of arm's length, but let's face it, uh, that's not really following their charter. The Federal Reserve Act of 1913 prohibits them from doing what they've done, yet they've done it anyway. Just to nail that point down a little firmer, they talked about buying corporate bonds in the middle of the global financial crisis. They flirted with that idea. I know this for a fact because I know people that were in the room that, that were having that discussion at that time. And they were had a lively debate about it. And they concluded, no, we can't do that. We, we just can't go rogue. We have a charter. We can't break the law. But this time they did it. Well, that's a bad sign because once you start coloring outside of the lines, you don't know how far outside the lines that you're going to color. A lot of people, and you use the word, Alex, monetizing, they're not really monetizing. It's close to monetizing. What they're doing is creating unlimited lending facilities, in essence, that facilitate the issuance of these, uh, you know, 16 plus percent of GDP deficit. They can, if they want to go fully rogue, monetize. To do so, they would have to either just be in uh, rank violation of their charter, which they sort of are right now with the corporate bond situation, or they could change their charter. Now, how you actually monetize is you declare your debts legal tender so that you actually are in true money printing, which would no doubt go along with further distribution of this printed money to uh, you know, prop, prop up the nominal value of the economy. Unfortunately, monetization has the same outcome every time throughout human history, as far as I can identify, and that is it leads very quickly to, let's call it hyperinflation, not just inflation. So you can look at the, the, you can look at the Weimar Republic, you can look, you can look at uh, France after the French Revolution, these things happen. You can look at the Zimbabwe. You know, if, if printing money is the uh, royal road to riches, how come Zimbabwe isn't the richest country in the world? So it also leads to some form of uh, tremendous social change, either through a non-bloody revolution or a bloody revolution. Often it's a bloody revolution. That's the danger that we have if the Fed goes there. And it's hard, it's hard to see how you don't ultimately go there when you have now $157 trillion of unfunded liabilities in the United States economy. That's 750% of GDP. You cannot pay that back in today's dollar value without enduring two generations at least of depression, you do, and which kind of would short circuit your attempt to pay it off anyway, it would probably snowball on you. So there's really no way to pay it off. So there's only two outcomes. You have to have acts of Congress that say, we're going to attack these unfunded liabilities by defaulting on them, at least partially. So you could raise the social security age, you could uh, raise eligibility ages for other things, you could make income-based changes that not everybody gets these, these benefits like social security, you could do that. And uh, that's one way to do it. If you don't do it that way, I think, I think you have to devalue. And so that's, uh, those are the outcomes that we're in. The Fed, the, the other risk for the Fed, and one that I am very pleased to say doesn't seem to be imminent, would be negative interest rates. Europe has gone to negative interest rates. It has not worked at all. Japan's been in negative interest rates for, for years and years and years, and it just keeps getting worse. And one way to look at that is to break up the world's banking sectors into those three pieces, Japan, Eurozone, and United States. So we'll take the major indices, the Tokyo stock market, the Eurozone stock market, and the S&P 500 uh, subsectors, and just look at the financials. Japan's sector, financial sector, has done nothing but uh, go down in value since 1995. The value of that sector of the stock market is now down fully 80 plus percent from where it was in 1995. The European stock market followed the United States in terms of its financial system from 1995 into the global financial crisis. They fell the same in the global financial crisis. Then what, something changed and the US went to a double top in its financial sector back a couple of years ago and the European market didn't go up at all. So the European market is now lower than it was in 1995 by double digits and way lower than it was in 2007. Why is that? They went to negative interest rates. That's the moment they went to negative interest rates is when the US without negative interest rates was able to go all the way back to the 2006 high and the European set, uh, banking sector could not. 
I think that's fairly convincing proof that negative interest rates are decimate your financial sector. Now, it's one thing to have Japan have a crippled financial sector, and it's another thing to have Europe. But the United States is so much bigger and is the repository for so much global capital that to, to have our financial system be a guaranteed destructor of capital would probably deal something of a fatal blow to the entire global financial system. So I'm glad that they're not talking about that. What does that leave them with? It leaves them to cajole the federal, uh, the Congress into getting stimulus and further, further deficit spending. And then to, to facilitate that deficit spending with quantitative easing. And Jay Powell has said in plain English on multiple occasions that he sees no limit to quantitative easing. There is no limit. So that sounds to a lot of people like monetization, but actually as we're doing it the way we're doing it now, you'll notice that we haven't had inflation. We've, we've gunned the Fed's balance sheet from zero to over $7 trillion. And there has been no inflation to speak of. It's been, it's been mired at one and a half percent on core types of data and can't really sustain over 2% on headline data for years and years. You know, if you want to win a, a, a beer at a bar with a bunch of economists uh, there in a conference or something, ask them what the highest core CPI was over the last, and I'm going to, I'm going to forget my own thing here, but I think it's 25 years. And the number is shocking. It's like 2.9 is the highest monthly year over year print in all that time for the core CPI. So it hasn't led to inflation because we're getting further, less and less bang of the buck for the amount of debt that we're putting out there. We basically used to get a certain amount of GDP growth per unit of debt, and now we're getting about a third of that. And the more debt you pile up, the smaller that bang for your buck gets. And it's kind of an economic uh, equation. It's almost a tautology. It has to work that way mathematically, unless you go to true money printing, which we haven't done yet. That temptation may become too strong to resist. And that's what I think the biggest risk is. Yeah, and as the world's reserve currency, we have a longer leash than maybe Zimbab Zimbabwe or other countries. But, yes, that, but that China has... wants to be wants to be in the in the conversation for sure of reserve currency, right? And they're making pretty good progress towards it. You know, I, 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 China's really kind of curious because I was looking at GDP forecasts again. I talked about that global guessing. The guess for China for 2021 is 8% GDP. The guess for 2020 in China is something like positive three and three and change percent. Whereas the United States, of course, is predicted to be like negative five or something like this for, for, for the year uh, 2020. And they've had nonstop economic growth for decades. You start to wonder with our, our uh, election system seeming to be kind of disintegrating ever since I'd say Bush v. Gore, we started to have problems with people not really trusting it and choosing to not believe in the result. So we've got a political system that seems to be crumbling and we've got a financial situation that seems to have, have problems. And we weren't, uh, uh, didn't have as much of a, uh, of a crush, crushing blow to the COVID as China did. And I've been saying this joke uh, for years, but it's getting more and more serious. Why are we so fond of this democratic type voting system and this, this thing called capitalism when we've had multiple recessions, we've got problems with the election system, we have, you know, we're having all kinds of issues. Maybe we should go totalitarian and we could have three decades of nonstop growth and we could have perfect responses to pandemics. You know, I, I say that largely facetiously, but it is, it's becoming more of an interesting question. Yeah, these are, it, it, it's pretty amazing times what we're going through, but let's, let's shift a little bit to inflation, inflation, deflation, because money printing ultimately should end in inflation. You have these massive deflationary forces that you described. We haven't had inflation since the 1970s. And now you have the Fed that has really shifted its mindset from fighting inflation like it's been doing the last four decades to, you know what, deflation is the big risk. We're going to create inflation. We're going to print. We're going to keep rates at zero. And, and so, but at the same time, like you mentioned, Japan and Europe has been unsuccessful in generating inflation. Uh, there's these massive deflationary forces that are offsetting that. 
So how does this end up? Do we hit deflation first and then inflation? You know, what, what's, yeah. the, what's the path? What does it look like? Yeah, that, that, that's kind of been my thesis going back really to 2008, that the forces, well, in 2008, a lot of people thought that the stimulus, which now looks like child's play, they thought that it would be uh, an inflation danger. And I became convinced that, and I, I had that view actually early in 2008, and I met a guy who was fascinating. I was talking to him for like four hours. And he convinced me that deflation would uh, be much more likely first. And I've believed that ever since. And I think that's been a good way to think. And the COVID, I think, is deflationary. Um, even though we would have transfer payments of $3 trillion that got spent, yeah, there's inflation, you know, in grocery stores or something like this, but there's not a lot of inflation out there. And I also think that this is deflationary from a wages point of view. I think work at home is deflationary. Um, I think that I've talked to a lot of CEOs. Uh, I've, I've got a massive client, a huge insurance company client, one of my biggest clients. I got a notification yesterday that they're laying off 150 people in their kind of uh, uh, investment platform wholesaling group, 150 people. And that's out of, th they're a big operation, but that's still a big percentage. I think there's gonna be a lot more of that. Uh, because I think that people have learned from work at home that uh, they're not locationally dependent as much as they used to be. And the areas where the concentrations are, are the high cost areas. And we see that a lot of people now have a preference away from urban areas. And also there might be, uh, uh, you know, they, they might uh, want to relocate uh, for cost of living reasons or what have you. And they want to be distanced and they want more space. And so you go to you know, uh, more rural areas. Well, I, I think that comes with a pay cut. I think whenever I hire somebody from Boise to move to Southern California, I gotta give them a pay raise to, to, to compensate them. Well, it's gonna work both ways. If you're gonna decamp to Boise and the, the firm is, re, is still in San Francisco or New York or wherever, I don't think you're gonna get the same wage. And also I think the fear of God has been put into people and they're not likely to, so to soon forget it. You know, the government bailed out people making $100,000 or less. They're not gonna bail out people making $125,000. And I think a lot of those people have no savings. In fact, I know they have no savings. And so when they looked, at, looked in the mirror one morning and said, I might be looking at an unemployed person, I think they probably said, oh no, I've got no savings. I, I, the government's not gonna help me. What am I gonna do? Well, what you're gonna do is look for another job if you get furloughed. Well, you're not alone. There's other people looking for another job and there's gonna be price competition, which means deflation. There's also gonna be layoffs, as I mentioned, one of, my, one of my clients. I've laid some middle management people off, not because of, uh, not because of an, any business reason, it's just because of a management reason. For work at home gives you a different perspective on how your organization operates. It makes you realize a little bit with a little bit more clarity what people are actually contributing. And you look around and I observed that a, a several middle management people, I couldn't figure out where they were. What are they doing? I mean, it's been eight months. At that time it was six months, but I was like, you know, I haven't even heard from this person in six months. And the people that work for them respond to me very quickly. I send it out to the, to the team, the investment team. I say, I need this report, I need this analysis. Right, um, and what, what gets back to me are the people on the front line sort of, and I start to realize that they're relatively highly paid bosses. We're really just kind of watching them work. And I actually furloughed a couple of these people. I, I haven't, I can't observe any, any productivity decrease. I haven't perceived any fall off in production, which means these people aren't really, were never needed. Well, that's deflationary. That's also unemployment. I think that this issue is going to become in greater awareness as the um, economic stress climbs the economic ladder of wages. And I, 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 so that's deflationary. So I really think we have a deflationary, disinflationary basic environment. As I said earlier, debt huge debt is actually, as you're piling it on, not inflationary. It it's actually slows down the economy and does not lead to inflation. However, if you get into a deflationary, a true deflationary situation, which doesn't seem a prospect, could, but it's probably more likely in the near term than inflation, 
against this massive amount of debt, debt to GDP in the United States is an all time record. Well, deflation will look pretty scary. You'd have massive defaults. So what do you do to combat deflation? You actually literally do print money. The Federal Reserve literally prints money and breaks its charter again and declares that liabilities are legal tender. And then the, game, the inflation game is on. For this reason, I think for long-term asset allocation purposes, we have to be as barbelled in terms of our portfolio construct as, as never before, which means part of the portfolio you need against that deflation situation. And what you use there is cash and you use long-term treasury bonds, as unattractive as they are. From any kind of fundamental investment construct, a 1.5% yielding 30-year bond, when inflation is running about that number and probably a little bit higher, at least for the near term, there's no investment thesis there whatsoever. However, what if you go into deflation? Then you actually do have a positive interest rate, as sad as that sounds, at a 1.5% nominal value, and you could have rates go down to close to zero uh, in that situation, which would lead to about a 30% capital gain. So it would actually have some value. I don't like them. Just like, do you like paying your premium for fire insurance? No, but you do it. Do you think your house is going to burn down? No, I'm not predicting that interest rates are going to zero and through your treasury. I'm not predicting that your house is going to burn down, but you have a reason to guard against that. So that's what you do. And then the cash is there just in case there is deflation, you can pounce. So you can use that to pounce. Now, on the other side, you have to worry about that ultimate inflation. And you'll notice that gold and Bitcoin have rallied like crazy in the past two years, um, since September of 2018 through September of 2020, gold went up by, uh, it went from about 1200 to about uh, to 2000. So that's a pretty big gain. Um, that is, is consolidating now, but that shows you what can kind of happen there. Uh, also, uh, stocks. Stocks are in certain environment an inflation hedge. You can, if there's pricing power, you can add a zero and two zeros onto the price of a stock. So it doesn't mean you're going to have purchasing power increases, but at least you have the potential for staying put. And you do these, this is a, sort of a nutty portfolio, a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, and you, you've got very little in the way of current income, but you're just trying to survive against the, these, these huge tail risks, which I, I do think are going to be part of that 2024 election story. I think that we're going through a societal shift of historical significance, just as we did after you know, World War II, and just as we did in the Civil War. It happens with some regularity. It's about, we're about due for one now. It's, they're about 75 years apart. We're sort of right on schedule here. And it was also predicted through demographics by my friend, Neil Howe, who wrote the book, The Fourth Turning, which is a recommended read by me, H-O-W-E, Neil Howe. He predicted the global financial crisis in the book, The Fourth Turning, written in 1997. He said, based upon demographics, we're gonna have a credit debacle in the middle of the OO. So he's pretty accurate. Um, that, that framework of thinking is very similar to what I did before I met Neil Howe, and I've incorporated that thinking in my framework as well. It suggests that we need to reinvent our social institutions and cultural institutions and political institutions before, by 2027 at the latest. And we're already starting to do it. If you can't see it happening, you're the, you're the frog being boiled in the pot. You're just not paying attention to your environment. Because if you could go back in time to 1995 or, or have, have an interview with your 1995 self, I don't think you would believe what your 2020 self is telling your 1995 self about the state of play in all of these institutions. They're being rejected. Museums, collections are being rejected. Statues of Abraham Lincoln are being rejected, right? Police are being defunded for real. They're, they cut the budget in Los Angeles for the police. You know, these things are being challenged. The methods that police use are being challenged. Religious institutions are being challenged. They're falling way out of favor from where you were decades. It's across the board. The electoral college is being rejected. There were, there's, there's Congress people, senior Congress people who have gone on record saying that they would not vote for the Bill of Rights 
if it came up today. They would want pieces of it struck out. This is big stuff. And of course, we have a constitution which is quite old. And it was born of a completely different set of circumstances. You know, when they, when they, when they wrote the constitution, they said the voting age is 21. Do you know what life experience you had in 1800 at age 21? You probably had been working for eight years. You probably had a business. You might be employing people. You probably had several kids at age 21. Now we've dropped the voting age to 18. What's the life experience of people who are 18? Instagram? I mean, that's about it. You know, this, I think the voting age should be raised substantially so that you, it, well, let me put it this way. If you want to be in the same spirit of the constitution from the 18th century, you'd be raising the voting age, but we're not doing that. So all of these things. So the constitution probably needs a tune-up um, and it will get one. It's either going to be a minor tune-up or it's going to be an engine overhaul one or the other. And I believe one of those things is going to happen in the context of the 2024 election. And also probably get three parties in the 2024 election that are funded. I mean, there, it, it really sort of happened this time because Bloomberg was funded. He didn't make it, but he still funded the, the Democrat, you know, kind of third party sort of activity in the, in the congressional and Senate elections. He wasn't the candidate but he certainly tried to steer it towards mainstream candidates. It didn't work. They, they, he didn't make any progress in Texas, Florida, the places he was targeting. But that, the, the fact that's allowed and no one calls it dark money or anything anymore, that it's happening in plain sight, these things happening in plain sight emboldens those that believe in those trends to act with greater and greater confidence and courage. And that's gonna continue to happen. Yeah, clearly the, the divide has been growing, not just in, in government, but in the US. And that trend is not slowing down. So these are- It's actually problems. spreading thanks to the migration yeah. issues. You know, the election, it's interesting. Let's go back to that for a second. The election, actually, if you hadn't had the migration from California to Nevada and Arizona, for sure, Trump wins, for sure. Because what happened is Californians is what, that's what turned Nevada potentially blue and what turned Arizona apparently blue. If you didn't have that migration, there's no way that this would have been flipped. Yet, it doesn't mean that there's actually greater support. Trump actually had more support this election than he had last election. He, he lost by smaller percentage. He would have won much more easily, actually, if it wasn't for these migrations. He picked up seats in the House, which nobody expected other than me. He picked up uh, it looks like he's going to retain the Senate. There was no down ballot coattails to Biden. It's clear that people wanted a insurance policy against the potential for socialism. But that migration is going to make these ideas spread further, because the irony of it is when you when you destroy San Francisco in terms of quality of life and you destroy parts of Southern California in terms of quality of life, and people leave, weirdly they take their voting patterns with them, <laughs> even though they're leaving what they voted for. It, it's, it's kind of highly ironic, but it will lead to uh, amplification and increase in, in all of these uh, trends we're talking about. Uh, thank you for that perspective. Let, let's talk a little bit about interest rates, if we may. Uh, you're the famed bond king. You've been successfully predicting interest rates for as long as I can remember. Um, rates have been falling in the U.S. for the last 40 years. Uh, some have been calling for rates to start rising, I'd say, 10 to 15 years ago. They're lower now than they were in 08. Uh, what do you see as the next big move? Is the next big move towards zero or is it up? Or do you think we're stuck here for, for an extended period? Uh, I thought prior to uh, what we know now about the election, I've thought for most of the last several months that rates were too low. From any fundamental perspective, they're too low. We've got a number of signposts for long-term interest rates. Let's just use the 10-year treasury. There's the copper gold ratio, which I won't get into why it works, but I've been using it for years and a lot of people have now taken up on it. Uh, it suggests the 10 years should be at one and a quarter. It's not much higher, but it's higher than the 80 or so that it is now. There's things like um, cyclical versus defensive stock performance ratios. Those suggest interest rates should be at one and a half percent on the 10 year. There are things like the um, seven year moving average of year over year nominal GDP, which is a very long term indicator. 
it is a very good long-term indicator of interest rates. It actually says interest rates on the tenor should be at 3.6 right now. And so I thought that uh, if we had a, a more of a, you know, COVID flare up leads to stimulus, leads to debt and all that. I, I, I thought the path of least resistance for long-term interest rates was up and, and it sort of was. I mean, the interest rate on the 30 year did go up from its low to its local high uh, uh, recently by a hundred basis points. That's a 35, that's a 20 plus percent loss. So it's not, it's not trivial. I, and I thought they would, the, the path of least resistance would be higher because of all the debt being issued and the lack of enthusiasm for buying it by foreigners, pension plans, and really pretty much anyone. And that did happen. But I figured that there would be a point at which the Fed would say no more. Uh, they worry about it and that they would then do their, what they've talked about, yield curve control. So like we talked about earlier, deflation and inflation, I thought higher rates moderately and then uh, being pulled back down by the Fed. Now, thanks to what we know now about the election, if it endures and we get smaller stimulus, I don't think interest rates will go much higher. Uh, in fact, by good luck, we managed to buy some, a fair quantity of bonds a couple days ago when we had that big down day um, as the stock market surged on it. Uh, my, the fellow who recommended on my investment team, and I said, yes, I think that's a good idea. He said to me today, should we, should we just take the gain and move on? And I said, no, if, if anything, I would add. So I think in the near term, uh, I think interest rates are likely to go down. Uh, it's, it, one thing that you could say that might be consistent about gold and gold and bond prices both going up is flight to safety. When you get gold going up $46 and bond yields falling pretty substantially in the last couple of days, it's flight to safety. So people are worried. Now, stocks went up, which is which is kind of odd if there's a flight to safety going on, but you know, Maybe it's the split government thing. It's, 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 it's hard because we don't know specifically what the outcomes are to try to be you know, gurus about what the message of the stock market is because you know, that's wrong most of the time anyway, but when you don't even know what the inputs are, it's almost a fool's errand to even try. So yeah, interest I mean, rates, the Fed is at zero forever, it seems like, uh, certainly for years. Uh, and, and then they're going to be manipulating long-term interest rates if they go too high. So betting on higher interest rates at this juncture doesn't seem like a very doesn't seem like a very good bet unless the Fed were to completely change their tune, which that it'll take them time to do that even if they do whatever. So those interest rates now when you get to away from the Treasury bond market, you've got the corporate bond market which is overvalued by a lot because the Fed has overvalued it. I mean right now one should anticipate based upon historical patterns of activity by lending officers, for example, commercial and industrial loans, they survey the lending officers and they say, are you tightening your lending standards? And we've had the type of, yes, we have been tightening our lending standards that you typically get in a recession, like 80% of them say yes. That's consistent with global financial crisis. It's consistent with the recession uh, preceding it of the early 00s. When that happens, junk bond default rates typically go to double digits within a year. They are, are rising. The junk bond defaults are noticeably rising. And my view is now that we have another COVID flare up globally, my guess is we're not about to see an improvement in the underlying fundamentals. So we're in a weird situation that the Fed has brought spreads all the way down to essentially pre-COVID levels, and yet they can't control the defaults unless they buy the bonds and let, and let the Fed eat the default, buy the bonds at par from the bondholders and let the Fed eat the defaults. That seems like, that seems a, a bridge too far to me. Now, at this point, since they've gone rogue, almost anything is possible. But I think if you bought a junk bond ETF today, I think that your return is likely to be substantially negative um, when you go to the fullness of owning them through the default cycle. Um, investment grade corporate bonds, the, the issue there is the yield on the investment grade index is 1.6 or so. 1.7, two no defaults, and the duration is almost nine. So if rates go up a measly 100 basis points, you'll have a zero return for five years on investment grade corporate bond portfolio. And those interest rates could rise, A, because maybe there is an impulse for higher baseline treasury rates, but what if there's just a growing fear of default? What if the rating agencies to save whatever credibility that they have left, what if they say, 
you know what, we have to downgrade this triple B market sector to junk. Well, the triple B market sector is now 300% the size of the junk bond market, nearly. So if they downgrade a third of it, the junk bond market is gonna double in size against a backdrop of poor underlying fundamental trends of defaults, because that's what would cause that downgrade. Well, maybe triple B yields or junk or, or investment corporate yields just on that basis alone should go up by 100 basis points, even if treasury rates remain unchanged. So you could have a pretty monumental underperformance in the corporate bond market. And uh, just, just to add a, a cherry on top of this whole situation, the uh, amount of debt in the corporate bond market is at an unprecedented level. The ratio of, of, uh, of debt, the, the debt leverage ratios in the investment grade corporate market have more than doubled since, since 08 and 2011, and the same in the junk bond market. So the underlying fundamentals are terrible uh, relative to history. And of course, corporate debt as a percentage of GDP is at an all time high, just as government debt is. So I, I just think that that should be avoided. And uh, the Fed has certainly bailed those investors out. That's one of those times where you were, maybe you look right on paper, but boy, you're right for the wrong reason. Because uh, it's all because the Fed went rogue. So I, I just think it's, it's not, a good, not a good place to be in that area. So it's hard to find, obviously, with these interest rate levels, with these economic fundamentals, it's, it's hard to find places to go. Where do you have to go in the fixed income market? Well, here's what, here's what investors don't want to hear. And it's true every single time that, th this, that there's a recession. You got to go where the pain is. You've got to go where it's dangerous. If you want to go where it's safe, you can be safe and have a return of zero because that's what you're going to get out of cash. Probably not going to get much more than that out of corporate bonds. So it's just zero. So where do you have to go? You have to go where there's yield. Where's their yield? In places that are dicey. Commercial mortgage-backed securities, asset-backed securities, you know, the, down the capital structure in the CLO market. These are things that are hard for regular investors to do because they're esoteric and they're dangerous, so they, you need mountains of information, mountains of experience, and mountains of systems. And most investors don't have that. So fortunately, that's kind of our, that's kind of our bailiwick. And so we've been interested in things like tr triple B rated CMBS, single A rated CLOs, and we've stressed them to death. So it's, it's recovered a lot because we're not the only ones that have figured this out. But you know, a lot of people, if you say triple B is CMBS, they're going to hang up the phone immediately because they they because the, the, there's a real and present awareness of of eviction risk and downsize risk and all this other stuff. But I don't think the triple Bs are exposed to that. You know, single Bs, yeah, that's why they're still they're never they're not going to return 100 cents on the dollar. So you have to get to those places where you, you're they're being discounted because of fear, appropriately but perhaps overly discounted. And certainly corporate bonds aren't discounting anything because the Fed has pegged their price. They've solved the liquidity problem. They can't solve the solvency problem. Yeah, I mean, it's a remarkably challenging time because part of what the Fed is doing is trying to stimulate by making cash as unattractive as possible, which has brought down you know, future returns of all assets across, across the curve. So the risk curve is becoming flat. And so investors who need returns are stretching and they don't want to go where where there's fire, right? And and so all that is bid up. And so so is your perspective that you should just accept lower, you know, because given where risks are, should you accept lower returns at least for the time being, or should you be yeah. more opportunistic? What's the general sense? I think you're supposed to be non-opportunistic in, in a in a generic sense right now. You can be opportunistic in those those fire zones that we you, that you reference and I reference. But that's why I talk about a portfolio that's kind of nutty, 25% you know, gold, Bitcoin, you know, real assets, 25% cash, which earns nothing, 25% long-term uh, treasury bonds, which prospects are poor, but they're, they're, they're there for a purpose. And then 25% stocks. Stocks, I think you're supposed to go uh, heavily outside the United States in stocks based upon valuation, economic trends, in some cases, demographics. I'm really talking about Asia here. Uh, even, uh, and I'm, I'm not a China fan in spite of my joke about why, don't, why aren't we totalitarians? I actually think China's not a bad bet right now. 
Um, and I like India for the very long term. And just generically, uh, Southeast Asia, I think, is, has the best prospects. Now, the bad news is that's a pretty strong performing uh, area of the world already this year. It's done broadly, the emerging markets Asia piece is up pretty significantly year to date. I haven't looked at it this week uh, with all this that's been going on, but it was up something like 12 to 14% on a year to date basis. So all the way back. Latin America, on the other hand, is significantly negative year to date. But I think that's for good reasons. So for the super risk takers out there, if you want to just take a flyer on something that could have good long-term prospects and is certainly locally cheap, it would be Latin America. I, I'm not there yet. Uh, I can't do it. So I'm, I'm out of that. But I think broadly speaking, there are so many trends in equities that are at extremes that in the past have given signals like gr growth versus value. I mean, value is underperformed by so much. Um, stocks versus commodities, th th that's a super cycle type of thing. Um, it's at the levels that basically it never goes lower. Um, things like, uh, you know, US versus other countries, a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, relative PE ratios, all of these things are at very extreme levels. They can stay there for a while and you're in a momentum situation, so it, it can certainly continue. But there's signs that some of these trends are already in the process of reversing. The dollar has reversed. I mean, the dollar's peak was January 2017. It's almost four years ago. Um, you know, the, the Super 6, now they've had a big boost uh, recently, particularly I think it's uh, Facebook, I think had a big boost. But broadly speaking, they're not really outperforming anymore in recent weeks. And it's too early to call that a trend. It's too early to ask, act on it. But I, I would recommend investors look at it because it's, it's, at a pretty, it's pretty interesting if the Super 6 starts underperforming, that's probably one of the dominoes that would lead to things like the non-US market outperforming. And parts of the non-US market have been outperforming the US or in line with it for three years now. So these are long, long-term trends. You don't have to act on them this week or even this year. But I think as you build portfolios, you're supposed to be moving in that, in that direction. Um, one thing that's great about being the world reserve currency is you can push the can down the road on some of your bad policies and your profligate spending and all that stuff. One of the negatives about being the world's reserve currency is you're not going to be the world's reserve currency forever. You're not. I don't care how much you think you are, you're not. Just like democracies never last. I was talking to some Italian investors and they, they kind of laugh at Americans. They, they say, why do you Americans believe that your democracy is going to survive? Democracies don't survive. They just, they just say that as a stated fact because they have a history with democracy in Rome. And it, did, it didn't work. It, it works until the political system that was born of the first turning, to use Neil Howe's phraseology, you establish changed political institutions, you do things like you establish social security, you have safety nets, things you never did before. That happens with buy-in. People like the fact that they can see a path forward, but then the economic and political realities drift away and they get further and further apart to the point where there's too much wealth inequality, the, the means of production has evolved and mutated grotesquely away from where it was when those institutions were put in place. And the, the um, property relations, they can't keep up. In fact, they don't want to keep up. The people who benefit from the property relations get the wealth and the power. They can observe that there's a growing disconnect between the means of production and the property relations, but they don't want it to change because they're the winners. But the losers get fed up with it. And so where we are right now is we got one foot on the pier and one foot in the rowboat, and it's drifting. And pretty soon you're gonna to have to make a decision to either jump in the rowboat or jump on the pier or else you're, you're going in the pond. One of those, that's, what, that's where we are right now. And that's, that's why it's important to be broadly diversified because if, if we jump into the boat, you're gonna get one outcome. And if you jump onto the pier, it's gonna be the opposite outcome. And so uh, you gotta, I think you have to be in, in both spots. If, you have, if you're lucky enough to have you know, be uh, comfortably uh, saved up for retirement times two, then you can do this split. If you're not, 
then you have the painful choice of having to pick one. So uh, it's 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 pretty uh, it's it's pretty daunting. And talking about those Italian investors, they 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 they're convinced that that there will have negative interest rates forever, and they just don't view bonds as an asset class anymore. They're government bonds. It's not even they don't put it on the on the efficient frontier anymore. It's just yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just not a thing. Yeah, you're clearly at a point where there's a wide range of potential outcomes and a, and a growing possibility of extreme outcomes, many of which are not in data sets that people, you know, unless you study history for hundreds of years across the entire world, you may not even have any idea what's coming. So diversification is probably the, the best advice. I think so. And, uh, you know, again, it's if you're if you're fortunate enough to have uh, socked it away, then you're in one one position. If, if you're trying to push it, well, you've got some of these pension plans in the public sector that have to, they're, they're borrowing money through their low muni rates and, you know, buying private equity. I mean, it's, it's, it's that desperate because, you know, it, it, at least you got a shot. It's kind of like people that buy lottery tickets. You know, it's like, well, you can't, you can't win if you don't play. Well, you're not going to win even if you play, but, you know, you're way better off just let, going, to, going to a casino and putting it on black and leaving it there 30 times in a row. You're way better at that than a lottery ticket, but nobody wants to, you know, it's, it's only, a, it's only a five bucks or a buck. Or I don't even know. I haven't bought a lottery ticket in probably 50 years. So. That's great. Uh, I appreciate your time. I know we're uh, running at the top of the hour and, and you have a hard stop. Um, so thank you for taking the time, sh sharing your perspective. It's always appreciated. Um, our audience is obviously very interested in, in what you have to say. Um, so I appreciate you taking that time, Jeffrey. Well, thank you, Alex. I hope it was, uh, you know, thought-provoking and helpful for, for the audience. And we'll see what we'll see what uh, January fifth, I guess, is the runoff in uh, is the uh, election, the Senate election. I don't know what they call it in Georgia. If you don't get, they have they have a wide open ballot, and that's one system they use. And nobody got close to fifty percent. I guess it's a runoff. They call it. That's January fifth. I mean, that's pretty far away. So we won't have true clarity perhaps for two months. So there'll be plenty of time for uh, Portland to riot if they so choose. I, I, I would think that if, if indeed there starts to be movement in the judicial system that starts to brighten the skies for Trump, there's, there's, gonna, be, uh, there's gonna be unrest and it's probably gonna be way worse because one thing about the summer, there were no counter pro protesters, not really. One thing, if you get if you get an election-based protest, you're going to get a counter-protest, and that means rocks on both sides, and that's what I'm afraid of. And uh, I'm hoping that that doesn't happen, but I would give that at least a 40% probability, sadly. So on that not so positive note, I'll say goodbye again. Thank you, and good luck with uh, the rest of 2020. We'll be glad to see it go. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll, we'll continue our uh, master speaker series early in 2021 with the uh, date and speaker to be announced. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, thank you. Goodbye thank you. for now.